Good morning, and thank you for joining us on this beautiful Saturday morning for a very informative workshop on butterfly gardening in South Florida. My name is Sydney Pies, and I am the Special Events and Program Supervisor for the Village of Palmetto Bay Parks and Recreation Department, and your moderator for today's workshop. Before we begin, I want to take this opportunity to thank Johan George, the Village IT Technician, who is assisting me on the back end of this presentation, and of course, our special guest leading the presentation, Terry Stephan. Today, we're excited to bring you the fourth presentation of our virtual gardening workshop series. If you missed the past virtual workshops, don't worry. You may visit the Village Facebook page to view the recordings. And the link to the presentation videos are also available on the Village website under the Parks Department page. For those of you who have been joining us for the last few virtual workshops and have taken all the great advice and tips that Terry has provided us on various gardening topics, we hope that your gardens are continuing to flourish. Today's workshop is all about understanding the uniqueness and importance of attracting butterflies to your garden. These incredibly beautiful insects will definitely bring more life to your gardens. By the end of this workshop, you will learn so much about what these insects have to offer and how to keep them visiting and thriving in your gardens. So let's get ready to learn. For those of you who don't know Terry Steffen, she is a longtime resident of Palmetto Bay of over 33 years and a lifelong vegetable and landscape gardener. Terry loves to share her passion for planet Earth and its particular ability to grow and heal. She feels that she can't fix the whole planet, but that she can certainly make her little slice of it as healthy and productive as possible. If she can teach her neighbors the basic principles of gardening, then her purpose is fulfilled because the whole environment improves. If Terry's face looks a bit familiar to you, that's because she's been teaching responsible gardening workshops at Tilada State Park since 2015. She has taught workshops about raised bed vegetable gardening, butterfly gardening, composting, growing mangoes, and even an art with gardening workshops like painting with tropical plants and flower arranging tropicals. It certainly has been a pleasure working with Terry for the past six years, and the village of Palmetto Bay is very grateful to have such a knowledgeable citizen and master gardener in our community, who's genuinely passionate about teaching all the wonderful and simple things we can do to make our planet healthier and more sustainable. For those who missed our previous workshop, Terry was recognized during the October 26th council meeting and received a certificate of appreciation by the village mayor and council for volunteering and committing her time, energy, and knowledge in the workshop she has taught throughout the years. Thank you, Terry, for continuing to share your knowledge and your volunteerism in the community of Palmetto Bay. Before I turn it over to Terry, I want to remind you that if you have any questions for Terry throughout this presentation, to please make sure you type your questions into the Village Facebook comment section for this live feed. At the end of the presentation, Terry will be happy to answer all your questions. Also, just a few quick reminders on some wonderful upcoming events and programs the Village will be hosting these next couple of weeks. Our next virtual gardening workshop is on Saturday, May 22nd. So make sure you save the date on your calendar to learn about ladybugs and other popular pollinators. This date for May has changed to the fourth Saturday. Get outside and take advantage of this beautiful and cool South Florida weather. Visit us at Corey Park after today's presentation and take a nice stroll through the Scott Miller's Farmer's Market. The Farmer's Market is open every Saturday from 8 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. on the southwest 77th entrance of the park. We now have new and wonderful virtual art classes for older adults 55 and over. Our next one is set for next Tuesday on March 16th. This art class is free and there's still time to register, so make sure you visit paintwithfaith.com to register. Hope you're continuing to crush those New Year's resolution goals. Don't forget we have two awesome outdoor programs. Gentle Yoga by the Bay Atalada State Park takes place monthly on selected Sundays. Classes are only $5, so make sure you register early as space is limited. In partnership with Nature Postings, Coral Reef is now offering SUP, which stands for Stand Up Paddle. Join us for this month's class on March 27th at from 9.30 a.m. to 11 a.m. for a day of fun and exercise in the water. To register, please visit www.naturepostings.com. Save a date for April 16th for our Earth Day Family Drive-In Movie Night. We'll take you back to the good old days of drive-ins while you watch a favorite classic, The Goonies. Space is limited, so hurry and purchase your tickets of $10 per car. 
Don't forget the Parks Department hosts virtual bingo the first Thursday of every month starting at 11 a.m. We look forward to having you join us, and who knows, you just might get lucky and win a few great gift cards to restaurants, stores, and much more. And last, next month, the Village celebrates Earth Day in an epic way. Stay tuned for all the upcoming Earth Day events and activities being offered in the month of April. If you know of an individual, business, or organization in the community that has made an outstanding contribution to environmental activity and leadership in the Village of Palmetto Bay through volunteerism, leadership, and or other services considered extraordinary in nature, we welcome you to submit your nomination by Friday, March 26th. This nomination form is available on the Village website under the Parks and Recreation Department page. For more information about all these upcoming events and programs, make sure you visit our village website at www.palmettobay-fl.gov under the Parks Department page or visit our village Facebook page. We look forward to your participation and seeing you at our parks real soon. Those are all my updates for now. And now, without further ado, I turn it over to Terry. Good morning, Palmetto Bay gardeners. Welcome to my favorite topic of butterfly gardening. Now, we're gonna learn about butterflies today, but remember, I'm a gardener. So we're going to learn about butterflies by way of gardening. Um, I hope that you learn to love it as much as I do. Um, I started butterfly gardening years ago when a friend who I didn't know very well showed up at my doorstep with a potted plant and said, I thought you might like this. And I was kind of confused because I didn't know her very well. And why was she bringing me a plant? Well, it turns out it was a milkweed plant. And that is a favorite for the caterpillars for the monarch butterfly. And that started the whole process. And now I have hundreds of milkweeds and I have lots and lots of other plants. And I wanna share my knowledge with you so you can have as much fun as I do. Um, there are around 100 species of butterflies in Florida and many, many more skippers, which are butterflies. They're not moths, even though they look a little bit like them. And most, if not all the photos that you see in this slideshow are butterflies from my yard. So I'm really happy and excited to share them with you. And I hope that you love butterfly gardening as much as I do. Some of the things we're gonna to cover today is how to attract them, and of course, how to keep them in our yards. Um, what are some of the common natives, and I won't be able to cover them all, but we'll cover some of the highlights. Um, the ways to keep them in our yard are through the larval food sources that the caterpillars need, the nectar sources that the butterflies need, and a few things about what might possibly go wrong, because sometimes in gardening, there are problems. We'll try to, we'll try to fix that up for you. Before I go too far, I want to give you my favorite tip of the day. I'm going to tell you a lot of things, but I want to also teach you how to find out things when I'm not around. And that is through research and not just research, but proper research to um, learn the things that master gardeners know. We use our friend IFAS, which is the Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences through the University of Florida. So the information that we share with you is university research-based. So it's not just lore or what somebody else might think. Um, it's really good information that you can trust and you can share with your friends. So the tip of the day is put in your search term, in this case, butterfly, and then add the term IFAS, I-F-A-S, and the results that you get back will begin with U University of Florida research-based data sheets and go from there. There is another term that you can use and it is E-D-I-S, e EDIS, and that will get you a similar set of results, um, data sheets from UF that are research, peer-reviewed um, uh, research papers. Really, really terrific information that you can trust and please share. So some of the things you're going to need, I'm going into mommy teacher mode. When you're gardening, you should be wearing gloves. Protect your hands. Um, there's lots of things that can go wrong. You should have on a hat and some sun protection. Sunglasses are good. Sunscreen is good. And a really good pair of gardening shoes. Please don't garden in flip-flops. Um, they're really great for going to the beach, but there's a lot that can go wrong in your garden. And a good pair of shoes is really essential. 
Um, you, for any gardening, you're going to need a water source. That can be a hose. That can be um, a rain barrel. Um, that, that collected rainwater is just absolutely golden. We're going to need nectar plants for the adult butterflies. We're going to need larval plants for the caterpillars. Basic gardening tools and make sure your gardening tools are in good shape. You don't need a shovel handle to break on you when you push down. You'll get hurt and it won't be good for the shovel either. We're going to need some sunny spots and some shady spots. Okay, so those are our essentials for butterfly gardening. Some of my favorite butterflies in South Florida, um, these are all from my yard and I sometimes I'll walk out in a, on a sunny morning at 730 in the morning and I see all of these within five minutes um, because I've given my butterflies a really happy place to live. So that first one is a Julia and with its wings closed, it will look quite different. It's a very, very beautiful, graceful butterfly. The monarch is the one that we all see so much. If you plant milkweed, you will have monarchs. Right now, I just um, germinated about 30 milkweed plants from seed. And um, with as soon as the leaves started to come out, the mama butterflies were there ready to lay eggs. The peacock is a beautiful butterfly and it likes weeds. So we're gonna talk a little bit about keeping a few weeds around, even though everybody likes their perfect green turf, butterflies like weeds. Gulf fritillary is just plain fun to say. Um, when nobody's listening, just walk around and say fritillary a bunch of times and you can't help but smile. And it's another one who's who looks completely different when um, its wings are open versus closed. So you see there in the middle of the screen, there are two different pictures of the same butterfly. The pipe vine, I believe, is a, he looks like a skipper. The Cassius blue, that butterfly is about an inch across with its wings open. And I feel like I should ask for a photography award for getting that picture. He does not sit still well. It's absolutely a beautiful, beautiful butterfly. The sulfurs are the yellow ones. Um, they, he looks green in this picture. Um, can depend on what they've been eating whether they look green or yellow or if they're in flight or not. But this one was flying around and looked extremely yellow until he landed on the grass and with his wings closed, he was green. Uh, the Thryalis butterfly is a little bitty red and yellow butterfly that is again, only about an inch wide with its wings open. And you see it here on a weed, another chance to keep weeds around. This is a Spanish needle, also known as a beggar's tick, that the little, a plant that gets stuck to your socks when you're out in the yard. So it's a really good reason to keep a few weeds around. Here are some more. The Phaon Crescent is a very, very beautiful one. Uh, lots and lots of different skippers, um, which look like moths, but they are actually categorized as butterflies. Uh, if you look at its antenna, antennae, um, they are very thin like a butterfly and they have a little hook on the end. Moths uh, antenna are more feathery. Um, one is more seen at night, one is more seen at day, and they pollinate the night blooming or the day blooming flowers. So that's some, some one way to distinguish them off from a butterfly. The zebra long wing, I think is everybody's favorite. It's the Florida butterfly, our state butterfly. And very hard to get a picture of because they move very quickly. Um, so there are two pictures there of them. The queen, which is often confused um, with the monarch, but um, very, very similar habits and uh, a little less showy, but still beautiful. There's another skipper and that one is covered in pollen. He's been very busy. There's another kind of skipper. And the Atala there on the right um, is an endangered butterfly that likes the Kunti plant. We'll visit him a little bit more in a minute. Um, big, big favorite of mine, very hard to photograph. He's a super fast flyer. And the giant swallowtail, another hard one to photograph, um, that likes our citrus plants. So there are some that you can, um, we'll learn how to attract today. So here is a typical life cycle chart. This one happens to be of the Atala. And if we start in the upper right corner and work clockwise, this is sort of how many days each part of the cycle lasts. So the egg will last four or five days once it's laid on the um, leaf in this case of a, on, for the Atala on a Kunti plant, um, then it will hatch and begin feeding for five to seven days when it's really tiny. And then it'll go into like this super feeding function or consumptive feeding for 10 to 11 days and it will eat 
like crazy and it will look like your plants are being destroyed, but the plants can take it. They know what to do. It will then go uh, become a pupa or go into a chrysalis where it will stay for around two weeks. And when it emerges, it will be an adult butterfly lasting a month to a month and a half while it, while it drinks nectar from your flowers and lays eggs. And the process begins all over again. So different butterflies have a different cycle. The days may differ, but pretty much this is what goes on with them. And a little side note, um, ladybugs have a very similar cycle, which most people don't realize, but uh, ladybugs are pretty darn awesome pollinators. So when we're dealing with raising insects in our yard, we have to be careful not to kill things we don't know what they are, um, because it could be it could be a ladybug or it could be a part of a butterfly in a different stage. So one big note that we need to take about feeding our butterfly caterpillars especially is that they are picky nickies. They are specific feeders and many of them can feed only on one thing. So if that one thing is not in our yard, we will not be able to attract the um, adult butterfly who's laying eggs because they wanna lay their eggs on the plant that their little baby is going to need to eat. In this case, this is a monarch caterpillar and he's eating a milkweed and he's just get nice and fat and squishy. The Kunti plant is the plant that is needed for the uh, uh, adult Atala. And here you can see her laying her eggs right on the plant. So she will keep flying around until she finds a Kunti, which has become a bit rare in Miami. Um, it's a really terrific plant to have. If you're going to attract a talus, you're going to need several of these. It's a rather expensive plant to buy because they're very slow growing and hard to establish. But once they're established, there's absolutely nothing to do. They take care of themselves and the talus will come. So the mama knows what it needs to feed its babies. If that's in your yard, she will come to you. Okay, so these are what some of the caterpillars look like. So you know what not to squish, please. The, um, the monarch uh, there in the upper right and all those little like antenna looking protrusions sort of off of it. The two will tell you that it's a monarch, but if I believe it's three, it's a queen. So the, the little subtle differences, the Julia or fritillary, and I wasn't sure what I had there, and if anybody's a butterfly expert out there, you might know better than I do, but that's that center top one. They kind of look a little bit creepy, but they make a gorgeous butterfly. The giant swallowtail kind of looks like bird poop, the, the caterpillar. Um, it's uh, a good camouflage for it, and that will you'll often find on a citrus tree. The Atalas are little bitty red caterpillars. They do get bigger than that. And if you see something that's very, very hairy, consider it to be very, very scary. Some of them, some caterpillars that are hairy like this will um, have venom in their spines and they can be extraordinarily painful. So my rule generally is if it's hairy, don't touch it. Um, not all of them are. And actually there are only a few in Florida that are, um, uh, poisonous or venomous, but it's just better to not take any chances. And that last little one is actually um, a baby ladybug. So it looks like something bad for your plant, but it actually isn't. It's eating up bad things. So let's talk about some of the larval food sources or the foods that the caterpillars need um, to eat in order to get enough energy to go into a chrysalis. Um, there are wonderful lists online. If you do your uh, Google search for caterpillar or larval food source, butterfly, South Florida, IFIS. I know that was a handful, but the IFIS is the key that will get you to the uh, larval food sources for the Florida butterflies, okay? So this little list that you're looking at is a partial list. Um, and in all cases, it's always better to plant a native variety of these. Many of them come in other, you know, non-native varieties, but you're gonna do a lot better with the native varieties. That's what these native butterflies need. Okay, and I'll show you some pictures of some of these plants here in just a minute. So you, this is uh, being recorded, so you can go back and look at this again, or do a uh, internet search, adding IFIS to your list, and you will find this um, list and many others, and longer lists too. 
So there is a trouble alert I want to share with you. This is a problem that we're having with our monarch butterflies specifically. I'm going to try one time to pronounce this, and then I'm going to tell you a much easier way to deal with it. Um, this is a um, parasitic protozoan that is attacking butterflies. It's not new. It's been around. It's been known to science for over 100 years, but we're really seeing some big problems with it. So let's try this together. Ophriocystis electroscura. And that's the last time I'm going to try it. From here on in, we're going to call it OE. That's what everybody's doing because that's a really hard name to say. So um, it can cause butterflies to come out of their chrysalis and be deformed and never be able to fly and they die. Um, not a good thing. So science is recommending that we try really hard to plant the native um, milkweed which happens to be the one here on the left, rather than the tropical milkweed on the right. The tropical milkweed is extremely easy to grow. The butterflies love it, but the native is better for them. So here we are, OE, the latest research. If you go on blogs, if you go on Facebook pages for butterfly enthusiasts, there's a lot of misinformation out there. And what you want is the latest information. And from what I've been able to find this week, this is the latest from uh, University of Florida, plant native milkweed, if you possibly can. If you have tropical milkweed already growing in the winter months, cut it back to three or four inches because these little pests um, attach themselves to the milkweed. So by cutting it away, you're improving the situation. Learn to identify native versus non-native milkweeds so that you know what you're buying. Ask your local growers to please produce and sell them. And um, monarchs are healthier when milkweed is seasonal. So the, the, the thought is that if we're not attracting uh, butter, um, sorry, monarchs all winter, that gives the um, milkweed a chance to regenerate and not spread the problem. There's a lot more information online. There are very long data sheets that you can read on it, but I, I ask you to please educate yourself about OE. So here's a Kunti plant, um, a very healthy little guy. These used to be planted all along, uh, planted, they grew nat naturally along the, um, in the, in the, um, in the forests, and then they were processed along the Miami River to make arrowroot a uh, food starch, and it pretty much wiped it out because it is very slow growing. So you can grow them. Uh, every part of this plant is poisonous: uh, the leaves, the stems, the roots, and the seeds. So you want to handle it with gloves and wash your hands afterwards. Um, the very, very pretty plant to have in your landscape. I've had dogs in my landscape for over 30 years, and they've never attempted to eat it. Some people are concerned about that. If you're concerned, don't grow it. But um, I've never had a problem. Passion vine is absolutely beautiful and attracts lots of our butterflies, both as a larval food source and as a nectar producing food source. Dutchman's pipe is really, really funny looking and extraordinarily beautiful. It's a vine and it grows like mad, so you need lots of space to grow it. And if you're growing it on a fence, consider your next door neighbor because it will grow into his yard too. So think about that, please. This is a spice bush, very pretty, nice smelling. Uh, it's a shrub. Uh, this is this funny looking word is called budlia. I personally have had trouble growing this. I have lots of friends who do fine. You'll notice that in the top here, it says butterfly bush. I urge you not to call it that because there are at least six different species of shrubbery that people call butterfly bush. So it's very confusing. So by calling it budlia or by calling any plant more by its botanical name helps us all identify them. A false tamarind is a rather large tree, very fast growing. Um, that's a nice native source. The Senna's, the Senna's and the Cassia's get confused a lot. I'm even confused by them. Basically, the Senna's on Cassia's will have yellow flowers and the sulfurs love them. So I have several different Senna versus the uh, slash Cassia's in my yard. And they're very, very pretty trees, very well behaved, very easy to manage, and they don't require much of anything. Um, they like full sun. Uh, this one, this funny name, is pronounced lignum vitae. It's also called the ironwood tree. It is a native, and it's probably one of the greatest things you could put in your landscape. It attracts butterflies. It's good for caterpillars. It 
it's fragrant. It's very, very slow growing. It's one of the hardest woods there is. In fact, it's so hard and dense that it sinks. It doesn't float. It's been used for propeller shafts for boats and lots of other things where really hard wood is needed. So Alignum vitae is a terrific tree to put in your landscape. Um, I can't recommend it enough. And they're blooming right now. So if you look around, you might see them in the neighborhood. Spanish needle is considered a weed, it sticks to your socks, and it's great for butterflies. This is a pawpaw tree, and it's a very large tree, so if you want this one in your yard, you need to make sure it has plenty of space. Sweet fennel is an herb, and there you see a little bee on there working his pollinator magic, but the butterflies also love it. Parsley is fun to eat and make tabbouleh with. Um, the monarchs and some other butterflies also like to eat it up. So if you notice that you're growing parsley and it's suddenly decimated, that may be why. Do not spray anything on it. Pesticides are the worst thing you can do to a butterfly. Wild lime is an odd looking tree. It grows in a really funny habit and it's a little blurry in this picture, but you'll see little tiny thorns on that center stem. They're all over the stems. They're lethal, they're extremely sharp and spiky, and if you grab it, you will bleed. But the um, giant swallowtails love it. So I do have one in my yard, but it is a bit of a maintenance issue. I have to keep up with it and trim it a couple times a year. You have to trim it when it's not covered with um, larva, so you need to pay it some attention. I don't recommend this for the average butterfly gardener. You really kind of need to um, watch this one. This is an ash tree, and as you can see, it's huge, so you need lots of space for it, but you, if you have lots of space, it's a great butterfly tree. Okay, and now we're gonna move right into some nectar sources. I'm gonna try to go quickly here so I don't keep you all day, because we wanna get outside and enjoy this weather. Some nectar sources for the adults. Again, same search um, method as before, nectar sources, butterfly, South Florida, Iphis or Edis. Um, and here is a link to um, a great EDIS publication, um, edis.ifis.ufl.edu slash uw057 will get you directly there. I'm sorry, that's miserable to type in, but um, just doing a search, you'll come to it and you will get terrific um, ideas on what you can plant for nectar sources and that's what the adult butterflies need, okay? So here are what some of those plants look like. There's a little typo there. I had a little uh, platform problems. That is a Hamelia patens on the top corner, um, all often called a um, fire bush. Again, it's one of those that's called a butterfly bush, but we prefer the real name. And the native is preferred to the non-native. I have, I think, five of these in my yard. The um, zebra longwing adores them, and so does the Gulf fritillary. Plumbago, this is not a great picture. I don't know why I put this one up there. It's a smallish shrub, maybe max is out at four or five feet tall. And in the winter when it's dry, it's covered in the most beautiful bluish purple blooms. And the, um, the Cassius blue loves them. Milkweed, that's a tropical milkweed there. Another Hamelia patens, H-A, um, Elia, it's spelled wrong, I'm sorry. Um, that's what the little flowers look like. And that trumpet shape in the flower is what butterflies usually like. So there's a zebra sitting on it and they're on mine all the time. And in fact, they sleep there underneath at night. The native lantana is very nice. I personally like the way the lantana smells. Some people don't, it's an odd sort of a smell. It's not the perfumey sort of a flower, but it's very nice. The fire spike is the funniest looking flower, I think of all the flowers and hummingbirds love it. Uh, lots of different passion flowers. Again, try to stay native, please. Um, the milkweeds, and there's a pretty yellow one that comes in a few different colors and again, as native as possible. And there's the kunti again at the bottom. So some environmental conditions that we need to worry about. Uh, we need to make sure there's some water to grow our plants. That's a gardening thing, not so much a butterfly thing, but they do need it too. We need some protection. So shrubbery where they can hide out when it's windy and rainy, because that happens a lot here. So they need to be able to hunker down. They need open space to fly around, sunny spaces and shady spaces. Okay, so um, all of those things come together and most yards have that, though yards that are not planned for butterflies often just have a whole lot of open grass space and that's really not a happy home for butterflies. They need a combination where they can go and hide out and lay their eggs and be protected. Okay, so I speak a lot about native plants because native plants and native soil 
will bring you native butterflies. And butterflies that are not native aren't really going to come to your yard because they need to be where they're meant to be, which is in their own habitat. So if we bring butterflies in from other countries, they may not be able to live here um, or they could cause damage here. So we need to give them what they need, which is native plants. And native plants are also much easier to take care of. So it's a win-win. When a native plant is established in your, in your um, garden, you probably won't need to weed it or fertilize it or anything. You might not even need to ever water it once it's established because it's meant to be in our environment with all its quirks and funny things about being in Florida. Okay. Uh, this is a fun fact. About 75% of all flowering plant species need animal pollinators for reproduction. As a result, pollinators contribute to ecosystem health and a sustainable food supply. So we think of pollinators and we automatically go to bees. Well, yes, bees are absolutely wonderful. They're fabulous. And our local native bees are not harmful. I was under a leachy tree the other day and I didn't realize it was full of bees. They carefully buzzed by my ear to say, hey, we're here, leave us alone. But I did not get stung. In fact, I have never been stung by a native bee and I'm in the yard a lot. So we want to take good care of our plants so that the animal pollinators can come take care of them as well. Um, and the great way to do that is no pesticides, folks, none at all. I was on a blog uh, yesterday reading, somebody asked a question about what do I spray on these bugs? And it happened to be lover grasshopper baby grasshoppers. And the answers that everybody was giving were all these horrible chemicals. And my thought was, no, if you want to get rid of something, squish it. I know that sounds awful, but the chemicals are going to hurt everything else. So please leave, leave the pollinators alone. Don't spray chemicals in your yard. Okay, save those pollinators. And I'm clicking and nothing's happening. There we go. Okay, so we're going to avoid pesticides because they go right up the food chain. If our bugs get sprayed pesticides, then the lizards will eat them and then the birds will eat them and so on. And it goes all the way up and it, it can cause a lot of problems in the environment. So um, leave those pesticides out. Down in the right left corner of this picture is a funny looking bug that looks kind of like an alligator. That is a ladybug larva. And if you didn't know that, you might want to spray something and get rid of it. But please don't because ladybugs are kind of our best friends. Okay. So what about the county coming in to spray when we have mosquitoes and everybody's like, ah, the mosquitoes are terrible. Please, where's the spray people? And my first thought is, oh, please don't spray. But if we think about it, some of the mosquitoes are carrying terrible things that are very bad for humans like chikungunya and Zika and West Nile and so on. And the, um, the thought from a government perspective, and it's probably right, is we really need to protect people first. I did ask about these chemicals and are they bad for butterflies? And I was told by some pretty high up experts, oh no, they'll only hurt the mosquitoes. Well, they do hurt the mosquitoes. They're also really bad for the butterflies. So when we get sprayed, my butterflies go missing for a few weeks, but they do tend to come back. It makes me sad, but I really don't want to get Zika either. Okay, so um, what we're going to do to attract butterflies is we're going to give them everything that they need to survive and thrive by creating a habitat. And that's by planting the, um, the flowers basically that they need. And those flowers are attached to stems that have leaves that feed the babies. We need some sun, some shade, and some open space to fly around and be butterflies and some shelter to be protected because they're very fragile creatures. Our water source for gardening purposes and um, the butterflies do need some water too. Nectar plants, larval food sources, and grab your camera because you can take pictures like this, which is very, very much fun. So keep calm, plant milkweed. Milkweed will definitely bring butterflies to your garden right away. This is a fun project. It's great to do with kids. It's great to do if you don't have kids around. I'm, I have adult kids who really pay no attention to my gardening whatsoever. And I have a wonderful time. It's a great thrill to walk out in my yard and see all the butterflies flying around doing their hard work and keeping me very happy. So we're going to have some questions and answers. I'm going to remember to do your searches using IFAS or EDIS. And I'm going to turn it over now to Selin, who's going to read your questions for me. And we'll see what we can do to help your butterfly garden. Thanks so much.
Terry, as always, your presentations are so great. So much to learn. And yes, I do think you deserve a photography award. The butterfly photos from your garden were absolutely beautiful. Thank you for sharing with us. And I'm sure it takes lots of patience to take pictures of butterflies. So I am going to go ahead and start with some of the questions that we have for today. Um, so the first question is, I got a milkweed plant and caterpillars ate it to the stems right away. How many plants do I need? Yeah, that's going to happen. They're hungry. Um, I find that the minimum number of milkweed plants for a habitat is probably 10. Um, that can sound scary from a, oh my goodness, I have to buy 10 plant perspective, but they're very, very easy to propagate. If you can get some seeds, um, one little pod from the plant will have maybe 20 seeds in it and the germination rate can be above 95%. So um, just starting them in some good potting soil and keeping them moist until they germinate, you'll have plants really fast. So um, from one pod, you can get 20 free plants, um, two pods, and you, you have a beautiful habitat going on. So yes, they will eat like mad. So you need enough plants to support, you know, basically a colony. But I, um, you can definitely go buy 10 milkweed plants Lots of people do that. Lots of people buy even more than that. And there are some terrific nurseries in the Redland that sell them, uh, the, the natives. But um, for sure, you can also um, cut the stems and germinate those in moist soil, um, you know, just, uh, you know, through the cutting, which is another free way to get more plants. Awesome. Thank you. I didn't know that you can you can do that with um, with cutting the stems and they will germinate. Are they mm -hmm. expensive? Are the milkweeds expensive or? Not really. Um, I think you can expect to pay um, probably less than $5 a plant, depending on where you're shopping and, you know, how, how mature they are. I don't think they're that expensive. And okay. a lot of times they come with free caterpillars on them, which I oh, always no. thought was so exciting. It's like, whoa, I get free caterpillars. And I was talking to a grower once and, and she kind of gave me a look. It's like, yes, please take the caterpillars with you. <laughs> it's not a grower's best friend. <laughs> Got it. And got it. Good advice. Good advice. So what about these aphids? So my milkweeds have these aphids all over it. What should I do about these aphids? Yeah, aphids are a natural thing. Um, they're, um, they're great food for ladybugs. So um, the very first time I saw them years ago, I was like, oh gosh, this is awful. And I sprayed them off with a hose and they do go off and then they, you know, they come right back. And then I quickly learned that if I left them alone and there were no pesticides in my environment ever at all, the ladybugs come and take care of it. And one night they can wipe out hundreds of them. So as hard as it may be, you can squish them. They're very squishy. If it really bothers you, just put some gloves on and mush them. But uh, the best thing to do is leave them alone. They probably won't really harm the plant, though they'll look like they're harming it. Um, if you leave it alone, nature will come take care of it all by itself in a miraculous kind of way. Great advice. Let nature do its job. Yes. Um, I do have a list. Um, I'm sorry, a question that came in from Facebook. I says, I have a good area that I've started. Um, however, there's more shade than sun. Any suggestions as to where to plant nectar and host plants and which preferred native plants? Okay, the preferred, I'll start from the end, the preferred native plants, I would do an IFAS uh, search on butterflies IFAS and get the plant list from the University of Florida. Um, it's, it's an extensive list. Um, to begin, I always recommend milkweed because it's, it's a no-fail. Um, uh, Hamelia patens is a really terrific beginner plant, very, very easy to grow. Um, if you have a friend that has a butterfly plant of any kind, um, ask them for seeds or cuttings. That's the, a great way to get started. I've gotten most of my plants that way. And um, I am very happy to share with friends. If we were in a live presentation in a room right now, I would come in with a fistful of things and just hand them out. But um, Hamelia patens is a great one because the Gulf fritillary loves it. Um, the zebra longwing loves it. The Julias love it. The birds, the hummingbirds, it's a really popular plant. And it's its a sort of a shrub or a small tree. It's very, very well behaved. I cut mine back um, every year right about this time to get them a little bit shorter because it can kind of get leggy and get as tall as the house. And then I cut it back to about six feet tall and that's how it spends its summer. 
So that's a terrific one. And with all my talking, I completely forgot the first half of the question. So I'm sorry, ask me again. No problem. She says, um, I have a good area that I've started. However, they are, they are more shade than sun. Any suggestions as to where to plant the uh, plant nectar and host plants? Okay. Um, if you can cut some things back so that you can get more sun, that can be very, very helpful. I find that I get the best results with most of these plants in full sun. Um, I'm trying to send, oh, I'm trying to go around my yard with my brain and think where is a shady spot. And most of my butterfly plants are creating the shade. So if, you know, the more, the sunnier the spot, the better. Um, and th then I would, when you look up the plant list through the University of Florida, then you can further look up the habit of those plants. So you, say you find Hamelia patens, for example, then you can do an IFAS search on that and you can get all the traits and characteristics of that plant. So you can learn more about it one by one and choose the one that you like. Thanks, Terry. I know that this is one of the questions we were kind of discussing um, regarding, you know, um, the butterfly uh, garden being in, located in a very sunny location. But as your presentation mentioned, you also need the shade um, portion of it too, because that's where um, you said to keep it away from winds, from extreme conditions, because um, that's where they're also um, laying their eggs, right, and feeding in certain areas. You mentioned something to that effect, right, in your presentation. Yes, they definitely need a safe spot. Um, we get some pretty wicked rain here. And uh, this last couple of weeks, we've had quite a bit of wind and you know, butterflies are pretty, uh, they're airborne and they blow around. And sometimes they just need a place to go rest and uh, rejuvenate and be safe, especially if the wind is really high and the rain is really rough, that can be hard on their little bodies. So they definitely need a shady, bushy place to go um, keep safe. Great, thank you. Um, Terry, question, because I know before pre-COVID, we used to do these workshops over at Talata State. Um, when you were there and did some of your workshops, did you do some butterfly gardens there? Someone is asking where in our parks we have butterfly gardens. I know for sure Coral Reef Park has one, um, but I don't remember if if um, if Talata State has a butterfly garden. Did you do any gardening there? Um, we did. We did a demonstration garden there. Um, we can't do a lot of butterfly gardening there for a couple of reasons. Butterfly gardens are not the most manicured sort of gardens. They can get leggy and messy, and the butterflies are really happy when they're messy. So uh, Thalata Estate is absolutely beautiful Kodak moment sort of a park because it's used for events. So we, they, um, the village was very kind and gave us a corner, which we have, I think, five different butterfly happy plants in. Um, it's over on the canal side. And uh, I haven't tended to it in quite a while. The gardeners there did a great job with it. But butterfly plants, you know, come and go. They don't last forever. So once they pass, we haven't been there in a year. I don't know if they're still going or not. Thank you. Hopefully when we all get back to normal, we start having our in-person workshops. We'll get back into maintaining that butterfly garden at Talata oh, Estate. It is a beautiful property. So someone chimed in in the comment section that I, I think is going to be helpful with a, a previous comment that was made. It says wild coffee and kunti are also great native plants for butterflies. Yes. So that was a comment that came in from um, another patron there to help out the previous person who commented. One thing about the wild coffee, I wanted one for so long and finally there was a little um, volunteer that was in a pot of something else that I had collected and I put it in my yard and I was so happy and it was doing really, really well. And one day I happened to look in my yard and suddenly they were everywhere. So I'm not going to say it's invasive, but they will, they will pop up. Those little seeds blow and they pop up everywhere. It's not hard to pull them out if you get too many, but just beware that they're, um, they're active, active little plants, but they're pretty. Thanks, Terry. Thanks for making that uh, important point. All right, I have another question. So can I buy caterpillars online? Do you have a source? <laughs> I think you probably can, and I think I absolutely would not. Um, if you plant native plants that are good for butterflies, the butterflies that are in that belong here will come with no further um, encouragement. So if you're buying them online, you very possibly could be buying them from outside of our native area. They could 
cause problems in our environment. Um, they could kill what is supposed to be here or breed in a way that we don't want them to. There's a lot of things that can go wrong. I would be much more inclined to just attract what what belongs in our environment. I think it's the best environmental choice we can make. That's great advice, Terry. Thank you. I would have to agree. Um, mm -hmm. Another question. Um, so if I plan to make a butterfly garden, what would be the top three plants I should consider buying to attract them? Or will that be based on the species of butterflies I'm trying to attract? Yes, it will. Absolutely. So if there's a certain butterfly you want, you need to get the plant that it likes. If you if you want to have instant gratification, get milkweed. Um, there are a lot of different kinds of milkweed. And one that is very popular is called a giant milkweed. I don't know the botanical name of that. It's a shrub and it can get as uh, tall as about five feet and the leaves are huge. And the nice thing about that plant is that the caterpillars don't strip it as fast because there's plenty to eat. So that might be a nice one to start off with. Um, the local, or rather the native milkweed is a terrific one. Um, everybody will make that their go-to plant. Um, again, Himalaya patens is uh, also called the firebush. Um, fantastic, terrific. I am a huge fan of the Kunti plants because helping Atalas is a terrific thing to do for the environment. A really fun one, so that was three, and I'm going to give you a fourth one, is purple plumbago because it's incredibly easy to grow, it's incredibly pretty, and the um, the Cassius blue likes it. So, um, And it's a really tiny little butterfly, and it's wonderful to invite it into your home. Thank you, Terry. Okay, well, I think I have one more question. Uh, so I see that sometimes during celebratory events like weddings, uh, butterflies are purchased and then released. Is it a good idea to do this? Is it good practice? Do these butterflies that um, may come from somewhere else, maybe another state or country, really survive? And can this be harmful to other butterflies? Yeah, if you don't know where the butterf the caterpillars or the butterflies are coming from, I personally would not touch it. Um, I know that it feels very spiritual to release them and watch them go off into the off into the sky, and it's a very lovely thing to do. Um, I, I'm not sure how environmentally responsible that is. If you really, really know that it's a native butterfly that you're releasing, that's okay, probably. I think that when they come in the mail, I really don't know how many survive that trip. I don't think it's very good for them. Um, I know that it is done and it is popular. For me personally, I wouldn't do it. I think I would um, prefer to uh, maybe write a prayer on a little piece of paper and light it on fire and let the smoke go back to God. Um, that that would probably be my spiritual way of dealing with it. Um, I don't want to step on someone else's spirituality, but uh, I think mailing butterflies and caterpillars isn't my favorite way to go. Did I say that uh, yeah. <laughs> politically correctly? <laughs> yeah, not a problem. We appreciate your your advice and, and your suggestion. So part of that I, I, I do agree with. Um, so I don't have any further comments, but I do have someone who commented and, and I completely forgot about this one, but he is correct. We do have another butterfly garden actually at Palmetto Bay um, at in uh, Ludovici Park. So we do have a, uh, a butterfly uh, garden there by the uh, where the library is is, um, is at. So thank you so yes, much for I, that. You, I think you the garden club me. owns that one. I'm not sure about that. Several of our local schools have them too. A lot yes, of local schools have Yes, them. yes, absolutely. So I think that wraps it up for our questions. Um, thank you so much, Terry. Um, once you. again, for another great presentation and sharing all your wealth of knowledge on butterflies and the importance of attracting butterflies to our gardens. Thank you to all our Facebook viewers for spending a little time during this nice and cool Saturday morning and learning about butterfly gardening. We really hope you learned a lot and the Village Parks Department looks forward to offering our very last virtual workshop for the gardening series on May 22nd. So make sure you save the date to learn about ladybugs. Now we start talking about ladybugs and other popular pollinators. And don't forget we have some great upcoming programs and events as well. Next week on Tuesday is our, our, is our virtual RT Tuesdays for seniors. There's still time to register. And if you own a drone and interested in learning more about the FAA rules and regulations, registering your drone and have a little fun with some basic flight maneuvers, 
Make sure you register online for this workshop scheduled for Sunday, March 21st at Talada State Park. It's a beautiful day to be outdoors and we invite you to take a nice stroll this afternoon at Cory Park to support some of the small businesses at Scott Miller's Farmer's Market that runs every Saturday from 8 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. More information on all these events can be found on the Village website under the Parks Department page or on the Village Facebook page. Also, don't forget that if you ever need to go back for a gardening refresher on any topics that Terry has previously presented with us, these videos are posted on the Village Parks webpage as well. Before I close, thank you once again to Johan George from our IT department for all your help streaming this live workshop on Facebook. And of course, our expert, our master gardener, Terry Steffen. We couldn't have done this without you. Have a beautiful and restful weekend, everyone. Please be safe and stay healthy. Happy gardening, Palmetto Bay. Bye. Thanks, bye bye. Have a great weekend. Bye bye.